uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to share, uh, uh, talk about, uh, like, how do we use eBPF programs in our network to accomplish our goals of uh, safely sharing the network at Meta. Um, so, uh, so uh, I'm Bala. Uh, I am Bala Suran Madhavan. Uh, I'll be presenting today along with Prankur, uh, who is uh, virtually sharing the, uh, virtually be uh, joining us. Um, uh, okay, the overview of the talk, uh, we are going to cover a few uh, a few things in detail. Uh, the first thing that we want to talk about is uh, what is the most common problem that we observe in the network and what do we want to try to solve, right? And this is in terms of data center networking space. So uh, you can imagine uh, short RTT flows and what is it that you uh, that you want to try to solve. And I'll be sharing one solution that has been effective for us in our fleet, um, and I'll quickly over also go through a bunch of other tunings that we have done using eBPF uh, that has helped us to, let's say, um, safely share the DC uh, resources as well as, let's say, help service teams uh, expect better performance from the network. Uh, I'll also go through how we use the stock tops uh, uh, hook point to design our own condition control algorithm, and I'll also go in a little bit and to like, why do we need to do that? And finally, uh, we'll also be covering on how we actually manage uh, all these BPF features at scale and like by, by both leveraging us to, let's say, experiment quickly, as well as, let's say, roll out these features at scale uh, and then still be able to manage. Uh, who we are, okay. So uh, this, so the, the work that I'm sharing here today is uh, as a collective effort by um, uh, a few teams in at Meta, uh, mostly teams at host networking, uh, network analytics, and kernel um, a, a partner in basically building uh, things and then uh, building monitoring and and so on. Okay, so the the, the major problem, uh, if you uh, if you want to have, uh, um, if, if you look at a data center network or a host. Uh, in a data center is is microburst, right? And uh, I, I have a uh, I have a capture here that shows us a, a typical uh, uh, a microburst in, on one of on a, on a host level, right? So if you if you look at uh, I think it's clear. So if you look at this, the time scale of this entire burst or the the time scale of this entire chart is actually just twenty milliseconds. Right, and uh, the the few things that uh, we have captured here or highlighted here is is what accompanies a burst and or what happens uh, when a burst is uh, is occurred. Right, so uh, so if you look at the first few uh, milliseconds, the first six to seven milliseconds, the the link is pretty much uh, uh, idle. Right, it doesn't have any traffic. The host is idle, and then you see a sudden burst. Uh, the the blue line that marks the ingress rate of uh, of the traffic uh, up to the next capability. So you could see that within a couple of milliseconds, uh, the, 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 the the ingress rate on the host quickly moved from 0% to close to 100%, right? And uh, this is possible because the RTTs for intra-region flows are going to be like in, in close to 100 microseconds or less. So in two milliseconds, you, are, uh, you, you have the potential to actually fill up the line, line rate. Right, and if you see, this is uh, sustained for like 10 to 12 milliseconds, uh, and then it starts ramping down as the service has transferred the data. Right, uh, a few things that are that are also happening along with this is you could see the ECN uh, signals to kick in immediately, uh, and then it tries to uh, pretty much at the line rate as well, um, uh, tries to slow things down, and uh, fine. And then third uh, is the the the, the Pink line. I, I'll come to the green line later, but the pink line. That's the unfortunate event of uh, packet discards, right? So this clearly shows that uh, your the packet loss in a in a in a in the data center happens not just because of uh, a complete uh, ninety percent utilization of the link, but these kind of bursts that triggers uh, uh, queuing uh, uh, on the downlink rack switches as well as on the receiver or host, leading to drops. Right. Uh, so the last line, that is a green line, is basically the number of connection. So the reason we want to highlight this here is this kind of gives us a clue as to like what is causing uh, this kind of a microburst. How can how can uh, a microburst happen? 
right? And this helps us to uh, root cause why this could happen and how we could solve it, right? Uh, Okay, so uh, uh, just to continue on to the number of connection count that we saw. So this is uh, the this is a typical pattern that we can expect from services that are running in the fleet that uh, in the data center. It's because of the scatter gather operations that is happening, right? So uh, an aggregator sits through uh, uh, wants to come up with a, a specific uh, data like a feed or something, and then it tries to query a bunch of leaf nodes to get the data back. Right. So if you see here, what happens is the receiver is the one that's that's uh, congested. But we saw that the signals that are uh, that are uh, given to the sender are pretty much like uh, independent of what's happening on the receiver. Right. The, the sender is looking at the congestion window and then it's trying to change it based on the congestion it expects. But uh, we see that the receiver is in a much better position to quickly react. Uh, to say like, hey, on an in-cast or a, or a microburst case. So uh, what, did, uh, what did we try to uh, uh, deploy here is we, we try to use the flow control knob in TCP uh, to try to tune this uh, at, the, at the host level. Uh, so uh, we, we, we developed a TC program uh, that, uh, that runs on the TC egress, uh, tries to intercept packets, and then uh, tries to rewrite the receive buffer based on the in-cast condition or the microburst conditions. If the number of flows goes higher, we advertise a smaller window and then uh, quickly dynamically change based on the condition of the receiver. Uh, so we have seen this solution to be very complementary to congestion control. Uh, and it kind of also feeds into the signal of uh, the latest uh, receiver-driven congestion uh, algorithm. So this kind of feeds signal from the receiver back to the sender and uh, uh, what did we observe? So as we deployed this on top in CASTI services or, or even fleet-wide, we clearly observed that uh, this solution was able to uh, quickly mitigate uh, a lot of uh, discards, packet discards leading to retransmissions. And also uh, eventually we, we also saw like a reduction and because of the reduction in the packets in flight, we also observed the, the buffer utilization to go down as well as the uh, uh, as well as the RTDs, right? Okay, so uh, uh, I, I want to quickly uh, highlight the need for need for BPF here, right? So yes, uh, flow control knob is, is a TCP kernel uh, feature. Why can't we just use it using a set sock op, right? Uh, so if you, if you, the key takeaway from this slide is uh, uh, doing, um, uh, doing, uh, trying to, trying to change a specific field within the kernel to what, value you want is, is a challenge in itself, right? Uh, and uh, the, the things that we uh, try bumped, in, bumped into when we tried to do the same TC program in a set sock opt is like things like, oh, uh, which callback do you want to do it? Do you want to do it in the on the client side, uh, on the active callback, or do you want to do it on the passive callback as well? If it's in the case of a server, uh, um, it's a listening socket. How do you know which flow do you want to set this value to? Because you need to set it to specific servers, a different value for a different servers, right? So, and also there are other features that that kind of decides this receiver window, right? Like there are features like the moderate receive buffer, which kind which the which the kernel does a lot of dynamic uh, intelligent stuff to adapt your receive buffers based on the receive windows based on the receive buffers, right? So you don't want to go tune your receive buffer just because you want to tune or receive windows. So uh, so implementing this using uh, the, the TC program was uh, was uh, pretty uh, independent of the other tunings that, that were already been done by the kernel and helped us. Uh, uh, okay, now uh, taking a step back here, right? So I had shared one common problem that we observed in the data center space and how did we solve it from a receiver driven uh, signal. Uh, here, th this chart shares a few more uh, tunings the, in, the, in, in a similar uh, uh, field. Like uh, the first one, uh, I mean, I, I'll highlight a couple here and then I'll leave it in the rest uh, for the slide. But uh, if you look at uh, long distance flows, right, the, the major thing that that is uh, causing an impact for services as well as the network are basically the, the large BDPs because of the larger RTTs leading to large burst sizes, right? And uh, we have observed 
spacing and uh, uh, using max spacing rate or limiting the max spacing rate for flows have uh, led to significant reduction for cross region drops which are pretty expensive because the rtts are now in the range of milliseconds right so we uh, so once we tune this we have observed um, uh, improvements for service latencies for the p95s or p99s to go down by 2x or even more uh, a few other things, again, uh, for long RTT, just to complete it, uh, we have seen initial congestion window tuning uh, to, to have helped with, uh, again, services to uh, optimize their uh, cross-region query latencies. Uh, we have observed, uh, in order to just improve reliability, right, like you, you, uh, we have seen tuning the connection timeouts to, to values that are based on the scope, like let's for example, if it's a short RT or it's in a DC flow, we would want the connection timeout to be much more realistic to the value that, that you expect rather than wait for a second for you to re, uh, retransmit, right? Uh, and finally, the CC selector, I'll go over this in mid more uh, detail. Okay, uh, now jumping from uh, network tunings uh, to uh, congestion control, right? So. Uh, before be, before uh, diving uh, um, deep into congestion control space, I want to first highlight what are the key aspects that kind of motivates us to, let's say, customize a congestion control. And this is what uh, the answers, the questions here are the answers that, that we need to, uh, uh, that answers these questions are going to help us say, how are, I mean, why do we need struct tops, right? So, uh, so like things like, uh, do you want your congestion control to uh, to, uh, to add more signals? Right? Do you want to add a delay signal? Do you want to add supplement uh, ECN signals with uh, with with other uh, other kind of signals to let's say to uh, make your congestion uh, uh, prediction better? Right. Similarly, do you want to improve your existing algorithm? Right. Like you might have a, a really good congestion control that might be working really well, but there might be a new traffic pattern that comes up in your network that you would want to handle, right? And then maybe you want to say, hey, I want to change the algorithm to handle this transient burst much better, right? So do you really want uh, to monitor your congestion control, right? Like at, at a flow level, do you do you have the visibility of, oh, if it's DC, DCP, what's the alpha? What's the, uh, uh, what is the current C event, right? Like, do you want monitoring visibility that, that you cannot get if you're running uh, a, a, a base version, right? So uh, these th these are like few of the key reasons that that we started thinking about, and uh, BPF stock tops was was uh, uh, was the direct way to get out get up all these benefits uh, as we built our new congestion control algorithm. Okay. Uh, finally, I'm I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to share a bit of a detail here. I'm not going to go through the detailed implementation of uh, delay based congestion control. That's pretty much a talk on its own. Um, what I wanted to capture here is how we uh, at Meta uh, build our own uh, delay based congestion control using struct tops and like what are the key or the highlights that uh, we wanted to uh, uh, tackle, right? So the first thing that we, we, uh, we observe here is uh, we don't want or like we don't want a lot of queuing which is expected out of DCTCP. We wanted uh, to set a specific delay and we need to control like how much delay you, you can expect for an intra-region flow, right? This has been our, our aim, which has helped us to reduce queuing uh, as well as like free up buffers in the network, uh, be it rack switches, be it receive, uh, receive buffers or receive, uh, receiver hosts, right? So what kind of signals did we, uh, did we look at? We looked at RTT, we looked at one-way queuing delay just in order to make sure that we don't have reverse path congestion. Uh, we also had uh, added uh, support to be able to still uh, react to ECN signals, maybe slightly differently than, let's say, what uh, DC DCP does today, right? So, uh, so we used. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the the stock tops program that helped us uh, to handle this. So, let's say uh, we added all our signal collection or uh, sampling uh, in packets act. Uh, adding adding here is basically going to give you enough sample set for you to make a decision uh, or that predicts the condition uh, in the network. Uh, similarly, you could use uh, calls like uh, set state and SS thresh to, uh, sorry, set state and C event events uh, to basically determine, oh, what is the step I'm, okay, do I have uh, condition driven loss, 
If so, how am I going to react? Or if I don't have loss, how am I going to additively increase my window, right? So uh, again, as I said, uh, explaining a delay-based condition control is uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty wide topic, but uh, I, I can I just wanted to highlight like how we use the stuck tops callbacks uh, to quickly implement one. Uh, with this, I'll, I'll I'll hand it over to Prankor. Uh, who will be uh, explaining more on the con on the control plane part? Uh, Prankur, yeah, good. Thank you, Bala. Hey, hey, folks, I'm Prankur from Meta, and I will talk about eBPF control plane that we built to manage ten plus transport tunings. Each tuning you can think has like various degrees of freedom, uh, which can be like rollout scope, inter intra-region DAC, uh, DC, rack, etc., or tunings which are applicable for like specific hosts, service, or even connection itself. The diagram hello, gives a brief idea on like how quickly we are able to like roll out new things with this platform and utilize its common observability and auditing and capabilities across features, thus reducing uh, mean time to productionize a feature fleet wide. Uh, later in the talk, we will go into like specific uh, requirements that we that we needed to build to roll out our custom TCA built entirely on eBPF and what challenges we faced and how we solved it. So uh, first, let me double down on like why did we actually needed to build a control plane for eBPF. First and foremost would be for enabling fast experimentation at broad scale, reliably and quickly, ability to like roll out rollback in the order of like minutes, and also to reliably configure the right set of tunings and features at the desired granularity. Also, it it gave us an opportunity to like build an infrastructure to do common operations, which can be required for like a lot of tunings. For example, it, uh, a lot of tunings want to know the scope of the connection, short RTT, long RTT. So the platform actually calculates it entirely and provides it for like all the tunings. It also gave us the opportunity to, to like uh, create an abstraction layer for all the BPF related nuances, like uh, managing the BPF objects lifecycle, pinning all the map operations and stuff into a single library, which is provided to all the feature owners so that I can build and iterate on it like really fast. And this also helped us in like adopting a, uh, a latest eBPF technology very fast. The next slide. Yeah. And now let's take an example of, of like what we really needed to build in our infrastructure to actually land our custom CCA. So assume you have like two hosts, a client and a test server host. These or both of the hosts will have two eBPF programs uh, installed. Uh, one is like a Structops eBPF program that's for registering our custom CCA. And one is the Socops PPF program called the CCA selector for setting the custom CCA for the connection. When the client makes a connection, it is intercepted by the Socops program at two different hooks or callbacks, ECN active and passive, depending on whether it's a server or a, a client. The CCSA selector, the SOCOPS program, there's a lot of computation to determine whether to set the CCF for the connection or not. An example of this computation would be like, what's the scope of the connection? So this information is fed to the SOCOPS program via a BPF map, via a scope resolver, uh, a library, which is also part of the platform. And also mean like connections 
can also match a lot of our policies. I mean, like they can have like a flow specific policy in case of a stacking world in which like multiple uh, jobs are running on a host. So uh, uh, after doing all this computations based on like various criteria, CCA selected determines whether there are connection needs are custom CCA on not if yes, a which one, how it, so the, uh, about the, which one, the control plane also, uh, uh programs the, uh, one other app for the sock ops PPA program with all the information about what all custom CCA it has installed onto the host. It is a very simplified version of like what we did, but I hope it gives you an idea of like how we envisioned and build an in infrastructure to, to deploy this PPA base see at scale. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the interesting part. What did we observe while deploying the custom CCA fleet wide? How did the following things impacted the deployment and how we dealt with them? The first one was long lived connections. Our entire control plane is a, a transparent sidecar to all the services. For any new tuning or a change in an existing tuning, we need to make sure all the connections are using the latest version of the tuning. Else we will in a scenario in which like old connections will be using old version of the tuning and new connections will be using new version of the tuning. As you can see, it will result in like where operation operational challenges, uh, uh, like ability to triage issues. We also need to work on like the interoperability between various versions of tunings, especially for the CCA. And in our fleet, we identified the connection life time can be in order of weeks <coughs> so we just five minute warning okay so um so we also wanted to do it without impacting all the, the services i like restarting it because we want to like make sure all the new connections or all the connections have have the new version of the ccm so our tcp iter was the answer we were looking for like the name suggests we are only interested in the tcp connections and we want to like iterate over all the active connections onto the host we do this iteration only once when our control plane starts and we have uh, we have collected all the data to make sure <coughs> uh, uh, this iteration does not impact any regression onto like the cpu or the memory a usage onto the host. And next slide. Okay. So how about when our control plane itself is down, maybe because of a restart upgrade or a crash happen, a crash of the control plane can happen at any time, or it can go down because of some other system level issues. <coughs> So in the time where our control plane is down, the services will still operate and they will skip all our tunings and stuff. So you can say like, okay, TCP iter can come to the rescue for this also. Yeah, kind of right, but uh, not always. Some tunings require to use, uh, some tunings require to use the state. It's so, uh, some tunings depend on like some of the state of the connection, which are set at like the connection start time, example, ECN negotiation, or they are dependent on to like the user space calls of like sets of up. If those connections are missed or events are missed, <coughs> a TCP iter cannot make sure or we can apply all our tunings onto those connections. In order to solve it, we decided to decouple the lifetime of our data plane with our control plane 
by pinning our BPF objects, maps, uh, links, and programs. But this way, we were able to like make sure our data plane is executing uh, at a lot higher time than our control plane. But with this solution, we did open a lot of uh, issues or like identify a lot of things which can break. Oh, for example, <coughs> when our control plane restarts, we need to update our data plane, which means we have to like uh, detach our old BPA programs, pin stuff, and load it with the new one, which also incurs some of the downtime. Of course, atomic upgrades can help us reduce or remove this downtime, but atomic upgrades are not available for all the hook points which we use. Another point was like, okay, now I need to transfer all this state from my old maps onto the new maps. But uh, what if the, the after upgrading the map structure itself changed? We need to take care of like all these cases and stuff of while doing this operation. And since we are pinning maps, we also decided to share it across processes because these a map stored some information which is relevant for like other processes also which added more complexity in like the synchronization and access control issues and stuff <coughs> in order to solve all this we created a bpf versioning manager but we feel like a lot of things can be solved easily if they are natively supported by the kernel I think that would be all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Are you planning to open this work up? Maybe research paper or open source it? Uh, yes, so we are working on. Uh, so, so I, I don't know which work you are expecting, but the congestion control. Uh, congestion control. Got it. Uh, so yes, uh, we are collecting uh, the data for needed for uh, for the congestion control part. Uh, but we have also uh, submitted a paper for the receiver based tuning, as well as we have submitted a paper for the control plane, like with the details on how how do we build the control plane, how to manage it. So, uh, I think yes, we will be open sourcing it soon as well. Thank you. All right, seems like everyone is hungry. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. And uh, let's gather together at 2.30.